Hey guys, so for today's video we are looking at the Chrysler Aspen. So for these types of videos, I look at the history of the car, major flaws, and then why it got cancelled. And I'm slowly making my way through most of the Mopar cars. So I've done the Dodge Avenger, Dodge Dart, and Chrysler 200. And if you do have an idea for another car, leave a comment below and I'll add it to my upcoming video list. I've seen lots of people ask about the Chrysler Aspen, so here we are. So in these videos, the first part focuses on looking back at the history of the car, then we're going to jump to talking about the events that led to the car being cancelled and any flaws it had. And as always, you can skip to a certain part in the description below. So for the Aspen, we begin back in 2007. So the Chrysler Aspen launched for the 2007 model year, and this was a body on frame SUV, pretty much a Dodge Durango disguised as a Chrysler. Many people called this the 300 of SUVs, because this was just like how Chrysler had the Charger and Chrysler 300 on the same platform with the same body, engines, and features, and they just marketed the Chrysler version as more luxurious, and the Dodge version as more muscular. For this SUV market, Chrysler was trying to compete based on size and price. So the Aspen was declared as, quote, an elegant and sophisticated premium SUV for thousands less than luxury price competitors, end quote, by George Murphy, who was the senior vice president for Chrysler at the time. So this SUV could give you that towing capacity and truck capabilities, but it also made the interior a nice place to be. It was a little bit smaller than other options like the Chevrolet Tahoe, but also a lot less pricey than some of the luxury competitors like the Cadillac Escalade, Lincoln Navigator, and Lexus GX470. Unfortunately, the Aspen was very short-lived, with just three model years before dying off in 2009, so let's look at the brief life of the Aspen. First off, there was just one level of trim available in each year, the Limited, so there was no base model or high-end model. You could get either a rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, but 2009 did add a hybrid option as well. And as you'll see on screen, base pricing was in the $30,000 to $40,000 range, with the 4x4 versions about $3,000 more, and this is the pricing that does not include the 5.7 liter Hemi V8, which was a $995 option, and we'll get to engines in a minute. The design of the Aspen never changed over the three years, and it was filled with lots of chrome. So it had a large chrome grille, chrome mirrors, and chrome accents on the side moldings, door handles, front bumper, and roof rack, and there was also 20 inch chrome wheels that were an option. The sculpted hood has stakes or lines that look similar to the Chrysler Crossfire or Sebring. The back of the SUV has jeweled taillights, and a power lift gate is available that will open with the press of a button. And the Aspen is technically a full-size SUV, but it is the smallest one in its class based on the height and width. The interior was mostly unchanged over the three years, but it was a bit of an upgrade over the Durango as they wanted to give it a more premium feel. The Aspen ride was quieter than the Durango, as there was optional laminated front and side window glass to prevent road noise from entering the cabin. Engine and body mounts and the suspension was changed from the Durango to improve ride comfort and minimize the noise and vibrations, and the body got extra insulation. And there were three rows that could seat between six to eight passengers depending on configuration, and the second and third rows can fold flat. The Aspen had best-in-class cargo capacity, with 68.4 cubic feet of cargo room if the third row seats were folded, or 102.4 cubic feet if the second row seats were folded. And the second row legroom did trail each of the competitors by between 1 to 4 inches, but the back doors did swing open almost to a right angle at 84 degrees. And third row seats give more headroom and legroom over most competitors. Chrysler offered two interior color schemes, a two-tone slate gray or dark khaki with light gray stone. There was light wood grain trim, leather wrapped armrests, white LED interior lighting, and a two-tone wood leather steering wheel that were nice touches for a more premium feel. The seats available were either leather bucket seats with suede inserts or cloth seats, and those cloth seats featured Yes Essentials fabrics, meaning that they were soil repellent, antimicrobial, and resistant to many stains, odors, and discoloration. And other standard equipment includes power adjustable seats, a parking assist system, the Chrysler Signature Clock, a MyGig media system, and a powerful 368-watt 8-speaker Infinity audio system. And I'll show most of the other optional features on screen. The Aspen was also a very safe SUV that exceeded government safety requirements. There were over 30 safety and security features, including side curtain airbags in all three rows, electronic rollover mitigation, park sense backup detection system, and brake assist to name a few. The SUV earned a full 5 stars for driver and front passenger protection ratings. Moving on to performance, this is where the Aspen changes from year to year. 
So for the first year in 2007, there was a 4.7 liter Magnum V8 standard with 235 horsepower and 300 pound-feet of torque. This was a flex fuel engine capable of taking E85 fuel. And there was also the available 5.7 liter Hemi V8, and that had a best-in-class 335 horsepower and 370 pound-feet of torque. The Hemi had Chrysler's MDS or multi-displacement system, where the engine shuts down four cylinders when less power is needed, saving fuel. And this is a great system on the highway, but it doesn't usually do much in the city where all the eight cylinders are normally being used. And either engine was paired with a five-speed automatic transmission. For 2008, there was an upgraded 4.7 liter Corsair V8 standard, which had a 68 horsepower bump to 303, and a bump of 30 pound-feet of torque to 330, from the 2007 4.7 liter V8. And the 5.7 liter Hemi stayed the exact same. 2009 was the most noteworthy year because there were three engine options instead of two. So there was the same 4.7 liter V8 again. The 5.7 liter V8 made a return, but it got a power bump, so up to 376 horsepower and 401 pound feet of torque. And there was also a hybrid version powered by the 5.7 liter Hemi V8 and two electric motors and these combined to deliver an output of 385 horsepower and 380 pound-feet of torque. This was a two-mode hybrid system that Chrysler shared with BMW, GM, and Mercedes-Benz. So the first mode was used at low speeds or low loads, where the car runs on either the electric motors, the Hemi, or a combination of both. And the engine will also shut off whenever the SUV comes to a stop, like in traffic, and it uses regenerative braking to keep charging the battery for the electric motors. With the use of this system, gas mileage for the hybrid shoots up to 20 MPG City, and it was only 13 MPG City on the regular Hemi engine. And the second mode was kind of like the same as the regular Hemi, with the variable valve timing and MDS system activating on the highway or during light loads, where four of the cylinders would shut off. But the hybrid did have an advantage over the regular Hemi because the four cylinder mode could stay on even longer with the electric motors in the hybrid system. So that gave the hybrid a 22 mpg highway rating instead of the 19 mpg rating on the base Hemi. Performance is pretty decent considering this thing weighed almost 5,000 pounds, so it came in at 4,866 pounds. The 0 to 60 time for the limited all wheel drive was 7.7 .7 seconds with a quarter mile time of 15.9 seconds, and I believe that was with the 5.7 liter V8. By the time 2009 rolled around, the Aspen hybrid version with a bit more power saw the 0 to 60 time decrease to 7.4 seconds, and the quarter mile time dropped to 15.5 seconds. So mom will still be able to blow the doors off all the ricers out there when she's taking the kids to soccer practice. The Aspen also offered two all-wheel drive electronic shift transfer cases. So with the 4x4 models and the 4.7 liter V8, there was a standard single speed transfer case that gave all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive high operating modes. With the Hemi, there was a two speed transfer case that gave all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive high and low modes. And each transfer case will split the torque 48% to the front axles and 52% to the rear when the all-wheel drive mode is selected. And buyers can also choose between a 3.52 or a 3.92 rear axle rating. The towing capabilities are pretty impressive, as the Magnum engine can tow 7,500 pounds, while the Hemi can tow up to 8,950 pounds. But this does fall short of some competitors like the Ford Expedition or Nissan Armada. And finally, the Aspen comes standard with 18 inch wheels, but you can opt for 20 inch chrome wheels with 265 50 20 tires. Unfortunately, Chrysler shut down their Newark assembly facility, which produced the Durango and Aspen, so the last Aspen rolled off the assembly lines on December 19th, 2009. So after researching the Aspen for a while, once again, it seems to me that the SUV was not inherently bad, and many Aspen owners actually gave it some pretty decent reviews around different various car websites. But unfortunately, the Aspen was sort of doomed for failure right from the start, as it literally is a Durango with Chrysler badging, and it just never sold well at all, which we'll get into, and it was also plagued by the Chrysler reliability issue, so not every single one was perfect. I see why Chrysler might have wanted to try the Aspen out, since they were already making the Durango at the same plant in Newark, Delaware, so it probably didn't cost them too much to modify the Durango and transform them into Chryslers. The head of Chrysler Marketing, Dave Rooney, actually explained that at the time, 25% of Chrysler owners were leaving the brand to buy an SUV, but only 25% of those people bought a Jeep or Dodge. So Chrysler wanted to launch an SUV alongside their Pacifica minivan to try and capture those buyers who were looking to buy SUVs and keep them within the Chrysler brand. The US full-size SUV market also made up 50% of the total SUV segment, 
so it seemed like Chrysler was trying to capitalize on that growing area. But anyways, that brings us to the next part of the video, looking at the reasoning for the cancellation and the flaws of the Aspen. I've come up with six different reasons and or flaws that refer to the car or Chrysler decision making and decision execution. So let's look at those reasons now. So the first reason is awful sales totals. The Aspen sold just 64,724 units over the three model years with a peak of 28,000 units in 2007. Given these low totals, it totally made sense for Chrysler to pull the plug on this thing. Why did it sell so few? Well, the automotive industry did suffer a major crash altogether, along with a recession, but I do have some other answers to that in the next few reasons. So the second reason I have is that Chrysler got caught in no man's land again, similar to what happened with the Dodge Dart and Chrysler 200. The Durango disguised as a Chrysler experiment didn't really work, and the Aspen did a rough job trying to do everything and didn't do anything the best. It had a clunky hybrid system, along with a mix between luxury, performance, truck capabilities, brawniness, and muscle. Other premium and luxury SUVs just had better offerings overall. So for example, the Toyota Sequoia and GMC Yukon had cabins that were better refined and more roomy. The Yukon had a similar hybrid system. Other smaller SUVs had better handling. And the Aspen exterior design was too bland and boring. Some people did argue that it was a well-rounded package for full-size SUV buyers. But even if you thought that, everyone could argue that it was just barely different from the Durango and most people that wanted a vehicle like the Durango would just buy a Durango and not an Aspen. The people that didn't need full-size dimensions and towing capacity would overlook the Aspen altogether, choosing other SUVs, minivans, and crossovers. The third reason is that Chrysler's attempt to make a Durango luxurious simply failed. The Durango was a brawny SUV, so trying to pass off the exact same vehicle as a luxury SUV didn't really work. People saw it as a Durango either way and they avoided it, and the Chrysler name also didn't help people's impressions of it either. The interior had too much hard plastics, uncomfortable seating, and too much noise. Why? Because again, it's just a Durango. I found that the steering wheel and gas pedal would transmit a buzz to the driver's hands and foot, vibrations would come up through the floor, there would be air conditioning noise, and more little annoyances everywhere. For the price, sure, maybe you could live with this stuff, but for those who wanted a true luxury SUV, they preferred to spend a bit more and go for a Lincoln Navigator, GMC Yukon Denali, Cadillac Escalade, or Lexus GX470, as these were a much more premium offer. The fourth reason is that Chrysler reliability issues plagued yet another vehicle. Chrysler was flat out unreliable in the mid-2000s, and I found that many Aspen owners reported several issues. There were lots of AC problems, the AC compressor would rattle during spirited driving, the AC would stop blowing out cold air if you had it on low for over two hours, or it would fail and only blow out warm air altogether. There were problems with the factory remote start, keyless entry, and security systems. There were electrical problems with the oil change light and tailgate open lights. There were tons of issues with the radio hard drive locking up and requiring a reflash at the dealer. There were many defective transmission torque converter problems. And last but not least, the fuel nozzle would shut off prematurely due to several different other issues. The fifth reason is the closing of the Delaware plant, where both the Aspen and Durango were produced. In October 2009, Chrysler announced that they would be shutting down this plant, and production of both vehicles also ended on December 19th, 2009. Without this plant, obviously the vehicles couldn't be made, and Chrysler did bring back the Durango for 2011 after a two-year hiatus, leveraging their economies of scale by having it share a platform with the Jeep Grand Cherokee, but there was no point in trying to bring back the Aspen again after the first fail. The sixth and final reason has to do with Chrysler cutting costs and filing for bankruptcy on April 30th, 2009. They were trying to cut all expenses, including laying off over 4,000 employees, raise their liquid capital, and prove long-term viability to the US government who was going to bail them out of their debt. It sure didn't make sense for them to keep the Aspen with its 20,000 sales per year, so it had to go along with the Durango. So that's the end of the video guys. If you like these types of videos, let me know in the comments section below and make sure to give some suggestions for which car I should do next. How do you guys feel about the Chrysler Aspen? Do you love it? Do you hate it? And did you ever own one of these? As always, thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe for all your Mopar content, and I'll see you in the next video.